Welcome to the Femsplainers. I'm Christina Hoff Summers. And I'm Danielle Crittenden. And I'm back from Portland again. Oh, back you're and back. forth. Yeah. I hate holding down the fort without you. I know, I know. I wish we knew how to, I wish we had the equipment that I could just do it, you know, on Air Alaska. <laughs> <laughs> I have a lot of free time. <laughs> Air Alaska, I know, but it would, no, it would be great. Well, we did miss you. We had, we talked about guns, which I said at the time that you'd be happy to skip that discussion because. You, because I don't. Really, I don't really get the gun thing. From uh, never mind, I don't want to talk about it. <laughs> but I, we we have to talk about Portland because I had, uh, I went to a bakery and they had gluten free, vegan, gender neutral, gingerbread people. Did they still call them gingerbread people? Because doesn't that offend people with red hair? Oh, and then the man. And the man? No, no. Was was it non gendered? Was it a the problem? Is it ginger wasn't kosher. thing? <laughs> and I couldn't eat. <laughs> so, it's actually, when we have family gatherings, yeah. my niece is vegan, my, several people are vegetarian, my son is kosher somewhat, and my mother is gluten-free, and then my cousin has allergies, and I have food phobias. So You when, really do have food phobia. I don't think people know this about you. I just, no, no, I, I don't think so. I'm just very Pick, discriminating. You're like a toddler with your food. Yes. I have to say, when you come over for dinner, I'll say things like, you'll say, what are, what are you having? And you'll try to sound very neutral and just sort of like, you're just like asking, you know, what's the weather like? Right. And I'll say... Baby eel. <laughs> no, I'll, I, I now know to say, it's okay. It's chicken. I have white meat chicken for you. It's fine. <laughs> chicken fingers for Christina, macaroni and cheese. <laughs> I know. And, and my stepson, Tamler, even though I raised him with his father and his mom, he is a food fetishist. I mean, he will eat anything. I was in Peru with him, mm. and they eat guinea pig. And they're <sighs> running around the restaurants, and it's a delicacy. What, the guinea pigs are running around yeah, the restaurant? the kitchen. Well, you go to these houses and have a traditional meal. I was not a happy diner. He ate the brain. Ew. <laughs> anyway. Yeah, I didn't even like them as pets. I don't like the concept. No, no. Okay, but so, but then a lot has happened. We're about to have the midterms. We're going to do a rare, somewhat political show, which, as as our listeners know, we try and avoid partisan politics. We but, understand both sides, and we fear both extremes. And we fear both extremes. So we have two women coming in, Ariel and Kodiak Hill Davis, who run a group called Republican Women for Progress. A Republican woman named Kodiak. <laughs> <laughs> and I think more like the bear as opposed to the camera. Um, okay, so it's maybe, not, yeah. <laughs> maybe. Anyway, they're in the very unenviable position right now of trying to find Republican women both to run for Congress and Senate or supporting the, those who, who do, who are running in a very difficult climate at the moment for women to be running on the president's ticket. I think we can say that safely without it seeming too political. I'm worried. We've, we've crossed a line. <laughs> <laughs> well, before we bring them on, and they will be in studio, which is great. We love in studio guests. While you were away, I got really interested in some of these stories that were being published about. I was hoping it would be a re reconciliation between men and women over this Me Too stuff. One was by a woman who wrote a story. It was called. I was a promiscuous teen, an open letter to all the men from my past. I, I found it a very moving story. You know, I'll just I'll give one quote from it so we get the feel of what it what it's about. She wrote, I was a very confused girl who wanted attention and love. Rarely did I say no. Rarely did I push you away. If I started to say no, I was easily swayed once a bit of pressure was applied. The fact is, I didn't feel like I could say no. Uh, so she sort of wrote about all the, not rapes or anything of that kind, but all those, what, small indignities, humiliations of teenage girls trying to navigate their way through sex and romance. And, and teenage boys have no humiliations <laughs> and embarrassment. No, no. Well, <laughs> no, but no, like, well, I, was gonna, I thought you were going to say no game, you know, like <laughs> flick the bra, you know, kind of thing. And then, and then the, about the same time, there was an article published in the New York Times, Eight Stories of Men's Regret. And this was about men looking back 
And again, not rapist, although I think some of the submissions they got in were really terrible, but they did. They would only publish stories if men put their names to it. <laughs> in the end, so you get very mild, often older men who are at no risk of being firing. But they did tell a number of stories. And again, it's all about the small humiliations inflicted, talking about, yeah, pinching girls' breasts or having games where, you know, they'd push each other into a girl and then you try and sort of rub up against her. Things like the things that I think are very familiar from our growing up and just the regret they had about that now. So I put that out. I thought this is a sort of interesting coming together of men and women acknowledging that these humiliations were not, you know, necessarily right. And then I got slammed on our Twitter feed by men very angry, like, why are you always telling us we have to, you know, I'm tired of being told we have to take responsibility for the girls, that anything they do, you know, or let us do is our fault. Well, there is and a little blah, bit of blah, that blah. in these, these new confessionals and right. men telling stories. The New York Times ran a series of stories about men atoning for their bad behavior. And they did behave badly, and mm -hmm. they should be sorry. But I couldn't help but think my own life, every woman I've known, and then a lot of crazy women I don't know, who might have uh, humiliated men, harmed men, used men. I mean, we could... What I don't want me to, to become is this narrative of overbearing men and fragile women. I think we're equals. I think we have similar... Men are more physically stronger, so that's a difference. Mm -hmm. But women are psychologically formidable mm -hmm. and can inflict a great deal of harm. So I wish the New York Times would would run stories, women confessing to cruel yeah. things. Yeah, what would, what would we confess to? We don't have to be literal. We don't have to divulge our past here. Although also on Twitter, somebody was very impressed that you got makeup tips from a famous tranny. You can't no. say that. Why? I don't Rhymes know. with granny. No, you have to say, no, it was Candy Darling, <laughs> who was pretty gorgeous. Yeah, she can. So, so anyway, so we do pull things out from especially your wild past. Mm -hmm. But what would be a sort of thing that a woman I just remember, would apologize I, I, for? I'm not, this isn't me, but I remember wild parties. And girls would very often be drunk and jump into a guy's lap and kiss him or mm -hmm. and there and then I not my generation because I think girls became more forward in the 90s mm -hmm. and there were there were aggressive girls and more importantly mean girls mm. who well there would, are, would th those go back it, that's to yeah, the beginning of time that goes to the beginning of time but I read about a case in Maryland just recently where they're calling it the mean girl case it was in Seneca Valley High School where two girls got together and just there was some I guess he was kind of a nerdy guy. They didn't like him. And they both independently accused him mm. of sexual harassment and assault. He was th thrown out of school. Now his parents are suing because they've confessed they, they made it up. Right, they didn't right. like him. That, that wasn't our generation. That's actually interesting, isn't it? Like, as the 90s generation comes of age, maybe those will be the confessions of those girls, so those who wrongly accused... Yeah. And wrecked boys' because lives. The media now they have the power right. to destroy. Or even or even I think what what I liked about these two stories is they were on the smaller level. It was the, the, the smaller humiliations that we inflict on each other. And and they're different. The women inflict different humiliations than men inflict on women. Yeah, we have different ways of making one another miserable. <laughs> it's j I think that um, happy, balanced society has to keep the ba that basic relationship in balance. And there has to be s civility. And Well, that was the thing I think I took, if I, you know, if I, I took, not offense, go, we, we never take offense, do we? We always, we can, we can, you can, we can, you can throw it. anything, can say what, you know, anything at us. Anything. Uh, except tranny, obviously. <laughs> <laughs> she said it. I didn't. <laughs> but what sort of I found was, just as we've been talking about anger of women, the anger of men and, you know, justifiably of, well, why am I supposed to take responsibility for everything? And that wasn't the point of this article, I thought. It was a way to say, recognizing, again, male and female differences, the, the vulnerability of teenage girls. In this case, this, this girl wrote that she was very messed up. You know, she was on drugs. But that sense of being 
a gentleman. Yeah, well, yeah, or or not being a, people who were not gentlemen, and and maybe yeah, maybe the the guys can quite rightly say, well, if we're not allowed to talk about being gentlemen, so if we're all going to be equal, everybody for themselves, and you should have been more responsible. But I kind of liked the civility that this was trying to hearken not back to, forward to, how can we have this civility between us? And I thought the answers from the New York Times men were not, you know, groveling or embarrassing. They were they were acknowledgments that some of the things they had done were cruel and out of line. And I think as women, we can look back and say the same thing. Yeah. And I think that's all to the good. But I think if it's only women complaining about men or men jumping in and atoning for sins and saying we're all guilty, we're all sexist, as Professor George Yancey did in this. He's a professor of philosophy at Emory University. I know. He must be so woke. I know. (laughs) He is woke. He wrote about it. (laughs) Read this article. It's called I Am Sexist in the New York Times. More woke than that, you implode. (laughs) Well, (laughs) it begins, you sent this to me, and I was like all, you know, very moved about this whole essays that I had been reading. And then you sent me this, I Am Sexist, in the New York Times, published October 25th. And it begins, men listen up. And it goes on to really be what? A self-loathing male? Self-loathing auto de fa. And you know, I, we're all I am sexist. guilty and deserve to die. <laughs> Toxic masculinity and, you, yeah. and every, his mind is just, is just full of slogans and not thought. Well, it's it's and guilt, and he wants to bring all other men down with him, and and then he's mortified that it, when he was a young adolescent boy, he was attracted to women's butts. You know, he would see. Oh girls yeah, he with, apologized for he that. He apologized for his path. You know, his pornographic imagination. Well, you don't have to apologize for your imagination. All right. Because well, it's also I, you don't have to apologize as a man that you look at women in ways that men do objectify them because guess what women look at men and objectify them too right and i although maybe men men are maybe more visual well i (laughs) i remember magazines uh, i think men look at women and i don't say this in a critical way (laughs) they look at women the way that you know those butcher charts (laughs) (laughs) like what i've always been actually really impressed by men is that they can look at a woman and say you know well, I like this and this, but I don't like that. Like, they can kind of take apart the package. Maybe I shouldn't say impressed, but that's what they do. Yeah. And women don't tend to do that as much. Whereas there's that old Yiddish joke, he's tall when he stands on his money. <laughs> um, that, that, <laughs> that, okay, so men and women look at each other differently, but it's really the actions that we're talking about. So he, this guy in the Times, our Emory professor, was apologizing for even having the thought that he might admire a woman's butt. But he didn't act on it. I mean, he didn't pinch it. He didn't, you know. And he talks about the, the dominant phallic economy. And what is the dominant phallic economy? Yeah, that's an idea of the like, French like philosopher Luz <laughs> Iragare. Uh, it's... Um, well, there's also a clitoral economy, isn't there? What? Ooh. I don't know. The I, French, I don't even know French. what you're talking it's about. The, it's not me. <laughs> there's a hermeneutics, a, what, clitoral hermeneutics. What? Okay. I'm giving a seminar on it next week. <laughs> <laughs> what is? Cl- and there's a special women's ways of knowing. That and, we know, obviously. And then there was Catherine McKinnon, who said, had a special epistemology. And it was something like this. Women have always known. I'm going to quote her. It's mm-hmm. not me. Women have always known that to know has meant to fuck. Like, I don't know. What? Yes, this is it. And, and he has Im- imbibed these lessons. And it's almost as if he's showing off for his... Right. No, I... I okay, that's exactly... Ex- I read this. It's, no, it's, it's moral exhibitionism to get chicks. Yeah. I, this and, is and just I a promise classic you, essay. <laughs> He's a harasser. <laughs> we can't say that. We can't say that. We'll Take get it back. Yeah, that's libel. But yeah, I, I think he actually is married. But is he cute? Did we look? Uh, no, we didn't look. Okay. But no. But that's the point, right? Like any guy who is this woke. Yeah, you, you, yeah. I, I wouldn't be surprised if there are students. 
Yeah. Never mind. Or, yeah, moving on. Moving on. Okay. Because you've been away, we've got some listener stuff to get through, including romantic advice. Now people are writing to us for romantic advice. I don't know why, but okay. But let, let's first bring in our guests, and then after, we'll have a little time left to deal with our listener stuff. Excellent. All right. So let's welcome Ariel and Kodiak Hill Davis, Republican Women for Progress, to the program, to the Femsplainers. Oh, yes, I'm touched by this show. Welcome, Ariel and Kodiak, to the Femsplainers. Thank you so much for having us. Really excited to be here today. Well, I, I want to, uh, the first question we were going to ask you is about the, you know, how you came to form this group, but I'm actually kind of interested in how Kodiak got the name Kodiak. You know what, Danielle? I knew you were going to start with a hard question <laughs> and one that I've been answering for, well, let's just put it, since the Reagan administration, yeah, I've been answering sorry, this question. Sorry, sorry, sorry. So our parents are actually really normal people from outside of Chicago, moderate Republicans, if you can believe it, and they gave us the wackiest names. Those are liberal names. Well, Very Ariel liberal. Hyphenates in the 80s. Ariel is, that's that's more common. Kodiak, right. though, is impressive. It sounds like you come from Alaska. Yes. Or, or hippies. <laughs> <and> right. Or <laughs> hippies. <Manga Canyon. laughs> right. So I, the story I like to tell is that they named me after a bear because they knew I was going to roar like one. Yeah. So I definitely don't have the size of a bear, but I've got the voice. Mm-hmm. All right. Well, so so... Let's go. Let's go back then to the formation of this group because you guys, both your uh, sisters, who come from a long Republican family, yes, <laughs> got fed up as many women and Republican women did in 2016, and you formed a group called Republicans for Hillary. Yeah, I would say that, you know, we really have uh, our two founders, Megan Malloy and uh, Jennifer Parati Lim, to thank for that. And, you know, I think that we were feeling really disheartened by the way the campaigns were being run and, and the way things were headed and happened to come across some clips of Jennifer and Megan. And they kind of were the genesis of the group. And I then proceeded to stalk them and force them to spend time with me <laughs> um, after after watching some of the things they had to say. And really, I think it just was about finding like-minded, kind of center-right I would I would term as kind of traditional conservatives who were unhappy with the fact that we seem to be moving towards having Donald Trump as our candidate. Yeah, well, that's uh, seems like there's a need in both parties. The extremes are sort of charting the direction. And so many people in the middle, like I would consider myself, a, I'm a registered Democrat, but I would say conservative Democrat. And I can always relate to reasonable Republicans. I cannot relate to angry people at, and, and both extremes. And unfortunately, in the, in the White House, <laughs> we have a very irrational person. It's just alienating to people, except his base, where, you know, apparently he can do no wrong. But do you think that this is pushing more women to uh, out of the Republican Party? Do we have evidence of that? I think it is. Uh, I think there is some evidence. I think there's some stats that I recently saw that we are at a, a point in, in our political trajectory where 43 percent of the American population identifies as independent. And I would say a lot of that group is made up of kind of centrists like yourself. You know, you're a more conservative Democrat and maybe you're not finding as much commonality w- within that party. We're not finding much commonality within certain branches of our party, and I think it's driving people to the center. I think most people, especially women, tend to be kind of down the line on things. Maybe they're more conservative on some issues, maybe more liberal on other issues, but they're not as extreme naturally, I don't think. And I I think there's rhetoric coming out of both sides that is really alarming, uh, Mm. quite frankly. Yeah. Well, I'd also add just to the point of women leaving the Republican Party. I think we're dealing with two different components here. You you have registered Republicans who we've seen have started to leave the party in terms of female voters. But then also something that we're really focused on is younger women. Frankly, you know, 
being on the older end of the millennial stage, like I can't imagine being a Gen Zer or with some of these younger people looking at the Republican Party as a young woman and thinking to myself, it could be my home eventually. Mm-hmm. Yeah, but I don't think they like the Democrats either. They like you know, socialism. <laughs> <laughs> or, <laughs> well, I yeah, I mean, I've been uh, uh, pretty much my whole life a Republican. And although voting for it less and less in recent years, because we've seen the direction that it's going. But I what I always used to resent, and this is this is a theme, Christina, you and I hit on all the time, as people who regard themselves as feminist minded or liberal feminists, you know, why do you not? Why will other people say, well, you can't be a feminist unless you believe X, Y or Z? And usually, you know, you can't be a feminist unless you belong to the Democratic Party and that Republican Party can't be for women. You know that I always used to resent that. But I resented it as a Democrat. Because right. I knew the history, and it was Republican women working with Democratic women and men that that brought in the, the, the second wave of feminism. It was in the late 60s and early 70s. Feminist historians call it the golden age of the women's movement. But it was bipartisan at that time. Mm-hmm. And we've lost that. I mean, conservative women were driven out of feminism. But it's also this idea that all women must think alike or move in blocks and you know, as Republican women, you know that that's not true. But maybe it's more true in the age of Trump. Like, I guess, so my question is, maybe now women are more coalescing together from different parties and in a way that they haven't more recently. I think we're having a collective female experience. And and I, I'm going to kind of construct a f- framework around that idea that whether you're a Republican or you're Democrat, liberal or conservative, there are certain experiences that are unique to being a woman. And I think a lot of those experiences, we've had a kind of a progression where we're acknowledging more of those experiences. And I think as women, even if we don't share all the same sets of experiences, we have a sense of camaraderie, uh, even even though there, you know, there are certain things that are they're said. And I, I do agree that Sometimes as, as someone who does self-identify as a feminist, there's this idea that I, there's only one way to be a feminist. And I think there's a whole spectrum of ways that you can be supportive of, of gender equality in this, in this country. But I do think we're, we're hearing more from women about this collective kind of female experience. And that has, I think, a lot of positive, but it also has some, some downside because I think there's some ways that this is uh, – some ways that it's manifesting that are not actually constructive – well, this is the, the the angry woman that we wanted to ask yes. you about. Are women, in fact, angry as I, voters, I should say? I, yeah. I would say yes. <laughs> what are you coming across? Well, you know, I think that we do a couple of different things um, at our organization. You know, we are really big on bringing things back to the center. But one of the big initiatives that we've had over this year has been our women to watch list. And that's different center right and conservative women that we are profiling and we are helping them in terms of if they have policy questions, really just trying to do some of the legwork to support them as candidates. And something that we've been really like encountering just in with everybody that we've been working with is that the establishment of the GOP really has zero interest in them. We have several different candidates that have come to D.C. They have talked to the power structures that be. And obviously, they are not in kind of safe races that they want to necessarily pour money. But there's also no um, infrastructure in place to support them in terms of developing them for future races. (sighs) It's incredibly mad. And you looked at the Senate Judiciary Committee and the Republicans and how obviously embarrassed they were to have to uh, ask questions of uh, doctors. We'll have to hire the and they had woman to, bring to come in, in. You know, <laughs> to hide behind her. It was so silly. Well, I will tell you, I spoke to a group of young, very young uh, Republican conservative students in California. The Reagan Ranch, the Young America's Foundation, organized an event. And in the past, the YAF was it seemed like it was more males and females. There were more girls than boys there. And they were fantastic. So there's a, there's a younger generation of conservative coming along that, uh, but very young, that might surprise everyone. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I think, well, if you look at if you look at the demographics, right, and I think you look at the lack of, of you know, I think across the parties, right, but if you look at the lack of women in federally elected you know, offices. And I think we can talk about this from a political standpoint and then from a cultural standpoint. Mm -hmm. It's really maddening, I think, to feel shut out of the conversation in terms of how 
our our country is being governed and led. And Democrats have done a, a better job, I think, of building up their pipeline. Mm-hmm. Uh, we're very focused on building a pipeline of female GOP candidates um, because we think that women... I, we think that representational government will be better if there are more women in the room. You have to get a little. But what you're saying is you're you're building up the pipeline, and then they get to the top of the pipeline, and they're 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 shoved back down because they get here and they're not finding support. Yes, and you know, I I would say that I also have this kind of perspective on it recently that I've been thinking about, which is as members of the GOP, we we are told and we kind of show the line that we don't play identity politics. But again, if you look at the dem- demographics of our party, everyone is pretty much an, an older white gentleman, right? And at some point, if you don't have diversity, then that kind of becomes the identity that you're playing mm-hmm. by. And so I think we play into this by saying we don't play identity politics, so we don't talk about the fact that we are we've had these experiences as women or we've had these experiences as Filipino women Mm -hmm. or as Korean women. And I think that that really handicaps different candidates from running to their strengths and really embracing who they are and what makes them interesting. Mm -hmm. So that's something that I've been kind of mulling over recently. How does Kavanaugh play amongst Republican women? Have you seen any reaction or change in opinion? Well, I think there's the, the Kavanaugh issue is such a great example, I think, of how uh, how nuanced these situations really are and how a lot of that nuance gets drowned out in media depiction and in, in kind of like general conversation. I think a, a lot of women in our organization were excited about his nomination in July. He's a, you know, a strong, uh, strong nominee. He has a, a great resume. And then... As more and more questions arose that involved character and integrity, I think we started to become concerned. And our primary concern was not necessarily the validity of the accusations, understanding, of course, that a Senate confirmation process is not a criminal proceeding to Mm -hmm. determine whether or not he was indeed, you know, guilty of some actionable offense. Our concern centers around the integrity of of the Supreme Court and that that court requires— the faith and belief of the American population that it is a rational body of jurists who are making nonpartisan legal decisions that determine the, you know, legal precedent in this country. And I I think we were concerned that the questions of integrity were going to undermine, that's a hallowed institution, and it needs to stay that way. It's a, it's a, it's foundational to our democracy to have uh, an independent Supreme but, but some people might say that it was, I mean, that both sides bear some responsibility for the politicization of the courts. And they would have seen what happened to Kavanaugh is just the Democrats were so desperate that they sunk to accusing him of, you know, taking seriously charges that he was a, a gang, organized gang rapes and, you know, just a baseless charge. So I think that might have led... It might. It seemed to unite conservatives. It did, yeah. and I, I don't. I don't think you're wrong there. I think this whole situation. Nobody won in this situation, mm-hmm. and I think that that was really disappointing to our group because this is this was an opportunity to have so a smooth. You, you confirmation didn't see process. women move away from Republican Party, or even men. More men move into it. I mean, I think honestly, I think Kavanaugh. I think felt like more of an ignition of anger that was there already. I don't think that it necessarily drove more women out of the Republican Party. I think for Republican women, particularly for, I would say, like centrist Republican women, the real question is how much like what is going to be the final straw? Right. And I think at this point, most people have either reached it or they've decided, as we have, to kind of dig in and fight for the party. Mm-hmm. You know, but I, I don't think that that was necessarily the straw that broke the camel's back for a lot of Republican women. Mm-hmm. Do you think that, as some have said, that with the gender gap in politics, that increasingly the Democratic Party is the mommy party, the Republican Party is the daddy party, and we're just going to have this this constant struggle between, you know, we want, you know, got to have law and order and lower taxes and then, oh, we've got to take care of everyone and be, you know, wait, 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 I'm, I'm concerned and yeah. back and forth. And then, you know, the, the daddy parties would say that she's bankrupting the country and he, she's going to accuse him of just not caring about the vulnerable and back and forth. 
I see this playing out. It kind Sounds of, like such a bad marriage. It's bad. <laughs> yes, I would also no, say that actually, it, it counts marriage. on the mother not being at work as well, <laughs> right? The more traditional view that the mom is is the kind of coddler and not the, you know, no, no. It definitely there are stereotypes, except that sometimes stereotypes carry Come from more somewhere. than a grain of yeah. truth. <laughs> Certainly, and I I do think you know from from my perspective, I I think from our group's perspective, we believe in a strong two party system is beneficial for all of us. And I I don't think we're seeing that right now. And I certainly think if the parties shift further into being gendered parties, Mm -hmm. we aren't seeing a strong two-party system. I think each party needs uh, diversity of opinions and ideas and backgrounds to provide the best possible approaches to, to the problems that we face as Americans. You can't craft good policy if you're kind of pigeonholed on either side of a spectrum. Right. And you you demonize the other side. Right. And you don't allow that that healthy exchange where in the truth is usually somewhere it's in the struggle. Nobody has a monopoly on the truth. It's in that struggle. You need a loyal opposition. And as you said, it's disappearing. And I see even in the women's movement, like the women's march, all these women came out and it was just a massive demonstration such as we haven't seen in decades. And uh, well, then they said, no, uh, women who are pro-life shouldn't, you know, were kind of excluded. And then in some of the official women's... Uh, they were officially excluded. They were officially mm-hmm. excluded. Yeah. That was a point of And then a woman, you life. know, there were incidents where Jewish women who, you know, were... Or one woman had a, I guess, an Israeli pro, flag, yeah, Israel. and she had a rainbow theme, and she was told to leave a, a gay pride march. Or, oh, I saw news of that. Yeah. Summer. And then you see the leaders. I mean, I go back and forth because I look at the extremes... In feminism right now, where the Women's March, you have people like Linda Sarsour and Tamika Malloy, I forget her name, and they don't represent most women. They don't, but yet they're sort of at the helm. And so that's very alienating, I think, to most women who would see the positions and they're, you know, sort of somehow bring in an, 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 an animus against Israel into all of that. I don't know how that fits in. But anyway, they do that. And embrace Farrakhan. And then on the other side, you have the Trump administration. (laughs) So it's just you go back and forth. Yeah. I mean, I think that I think that part of what goes into this kind of feminine anger outside of having kind of a collective realization of some of the experiences that we've had and, and not being comfortable with them. Outside of that, I think that when you're looking at kind of modern feminism, right, if the if the baseline kind of assumption of of people coming out of, I think, our generation and younger is, you know, we were raised with this idea that we can accomplish the same things as men, that we have bodily autonomy, that we are strong, and that we can be independent and all these things. And then you start, I think, reconciling yourself to some of, you know, the pay gap, the wage gap issues, the differences in paid family leave, kind of how our, our communities deal with sexual assault. I think there's a lot of fear right now for women that what this administration and this kind of cultural shift into more tribalism boils down to really is safety for your for your personhood as a woman in this in this society right now. And I'm not saying that I th- that that's how I necessarily feel, but I do think that that's kind of the prevalent idea. And so I think when you when you look at it from that viewpoint and that vantage point, it makes sense that people would be really angry and would be shifting, I think, into a more democratic side Mm -hmm. if they feel that they are embattled and that they are fighting for, you know, their ability to, you know, direct their own lives and live their own lives and succeed and not be kind of handmaids. I think there's a reason why people feel that's really resonant right now. Well, it's it it's, must be very difficult to run as a woman and a Republican. I mean, we're seeing the sort of record numbers of women who are running on the Democratic side. What are the challenges you face running right now as a woman, as a Republican? Where are we seeing these women running? And, and is it just like a doomed, <laughs> is it a doomed <laughs> mission at this Hell, point? Doom and gloom tonight. Well, <laughs> you know, we would certainly, <laughs> like, we... It's hard. The work we're doing is very hard. We have an uphill battle, I think, to get more women engaged and involved in the Republican Party. There are a lot of Republican women in this country, but getting them engaged in in the party leadership and into elected office 
that's that's a challenge. And certainly, as Ariel mentioned, it's critical to us to to pull in younger women because mm-hmm. at some point you're only as good as the next generation. And I do think I do think it is it's an uphill battle, but I don't think it, there's reason to despair. Mm-hmm. I think, unfortunately, and we've gone back and forth. Our organization has with several media outlets who have elected to only cover the fact that a lot of Dem women are running, which mm-hmm. we think is great. That's wonderful. Women running for office is great. There are Republican women running for office in record numbers, and it's not being covered anywhere. Yeah, it's well, only like 59 female G- GOP women for Congress and six against in in the Senate are running against other women, six candidates. Yes. Yeah. So a like woman Arizona. versus woman. Mm-hmm. Wisconsin. Mm-hmm. So. Yes. Wisconsin is another example of that, I think, which is great. That's a great thing to me because it neutralizes a, a lot of points and it really allows you to look at the candidates for their merits, which is, I think, something we feel very strongly about. But again, a lot of that's just not being covered. It's all about the blue wave. It's all about, you know, look at how angry, you know, Dem women are and how they're they're turning out and they're running for office just like they did in 92 after the Anita Hill hearings. But they're not covering the fact that Republican women are also a bit disillusioned and frustrated and they're turning that that frustration into action by running. And you feel these women are running on your kind of platform, as it were, or, or are they running as Trump supporters? Are you, I assume it varies from place to it place. It does. What are you? I think there are. I think there are a lot that are more center right, so, than, and they tiptoe around. They have yeah. to. I mean, an elephant. Point. I yeah, think it's, have to. it's it's also very challenging. I think part of the the struggle where if you're a Democratic woman and you're running in this cycle, it's very easy to lean into the kind of anti-Trump rhetoric and kind of really embrace that anger and that fire in your belly, right? I think for Republican women, it's a much trickier proposition to to manage getting through a primary, you know, where you have the tribal instincts really coming to the forefront without embracing Trump in some way. You know, you know, what's a big difference for both parties is that the the because the academy is so liberal and gender studies, women's studies, primarily left wing women. There are very few conservative women interpreting gender, coming up with theories. Like you mentioned the wage gap. Uh, You know, as a libertarian feminist, I have a slightly different view and think a lot of it. I just don't think we're getting a good analysis Mm -hmm. from the hard left feminists. And for years, I have told conservatives that you need women's think tanks. And to, to go th- and get serious scholars, get lawyers, get people to go through. And I tried to bully you into starting one. I, <laughs> I tried. That. I, there, there, Ladies, I, we, don't, we have free time. We can yeah. start this. <laughs> no, there's no one's out there. A billionaire out there. <laughs> we need there a billionaire. Need, and it, it doesn't have to be even political. If we mm-hmm. could just get so many of these issues, like we, you mentioned sexual assault. I know that on campus there's a lot of hysteria, exaggeration. Why not get the truth? Why not? I mean, the if, if there, Institute. We need for we progress. Need, yes, yes. <laughs> I would love that. Oh, we I think we could do some really cool things with that. And cool things, <laughs> and then it, then we'd know what the issues were, right? And what's what's you know a reality based uh, conservative women's movement that's pro free market and pro. I think global trade. Can we admit that? Uh, I mean, I've around me, in our perspective, yes. For sure. <laughs> no, it's no, it's bizarre. on Amazon for an affordable price. And yeah, and, and it also no, it's bizarre alleviated that... poverty throughout the world in ways right. which... Yes. No, but the GOP has become the party of anti-trade and protectionism mm-hmm. is, is a real throwback. But let's go back to... I want to talk about my peeps, the women who let me down this election, I have to say, is when I was talking to David before the election. My husband follows politics much more closely than I do. And he said, think of all those suburban women who, and he meant like me, who use French cookware. And they, he said, do you think those women are going to vote for Trump? And I said, no, of course they're not going to vote for Trump because we're I don't know if the suburban women with the French cookware is uh, the no, most sympathetic. No, and they did. They did. <laughs> Democrat. And they let me down. And they did oh. vote for Trump. And that's one of the reasons he won, because he got these women who unexpectedly, despite, you know, his history Just with the price of Manola Blahniks is enough to, you know. <laughs> I, well, you know, I, I th- anyway, they let me down. And I understand they are now maybe going to let Trump down this time. So... What's the situation with that? And and who are the women now? Where is 
where are the Republicans finding female support? Yeah, I would say that I think that 2016, there were so many different components going into that election, you know, and I think really Hillary Clinton was just so polarizing, I think, for women and for men. And Bill um, with his and, history. And Bill, right? I think <laughs> Absolutely. I think that they're just polarizing figures. Yeah. And I yeah. think there were a lot of women who Republican, suburban, educated, own French cookware Republican women. The Crusette of, women uh, let me down. <laughs> held their noses and, and voted for him. Yeah. But I think I think that most of those were not most of those women. I don't want to speak to most of those women, but I think that there is a portion of the Republican um, suburban women voter bloc that is really tired of what's going on right now in the political sphere. And I don't just mean in terms of policy, right, because I think that there there are still components of the policy. We've talked about this actually within our group, that there's still parts of this, you know, administration that really speak to me, right? I mm-hmm. I work in a trade association. I'm pretty much in favor of a lot of the deregulation that's going on. But it doesn't mean that I'm happy with how far afield we're getting in terms of normal governance and in terms of civility and how we're treating each other. And I think that's where you're seeing a lot of women kind of move to the left, at least in terms of potentially voting for for Democrats and not supporting Republicans this cycle. Where do you stand on those hot button issues like abortion in the I mean, that's always an issue for Republican women. Do you do you just not take a stance or how do you sort of confront those. So we, in our first year, you know, we really were focused on candidate training and and things of that nature, but we are rolling out a policy platform. We don't take a stance on abortion in particular. We are big supporters of moving back to the big tent. So personally, I am very pro-choice. I mean, my third hat that I wear (laughs) is that I'm um, a Planned Parenthood ambassador in D.C., right? So I do everyone's head in. I'm a Republican that works for Planned Parenthood and has blue hair, right? Like nobody understands. She does have blue streaks in her hair, Um, just in case you were wondering. (laughs) But you know what that meant. Explain the free market (laughs) to young women. And right. and why deregulation isn't necessarily you know it's just a bad thing. Some yeah. of the frivolous re- regulation that just right. happens. if that that would be so valuable yeah, because absolutely. there's so much economic illiteracy and the, now the the history curriculum is sort of just biased in the high schools for whatever reason it got out of control mm-hmm. and so they come in thinking that capitalism which just means economic freedom. So to to both of your points, which I think are very well taken, uh, we would like our group would like to to shift the conversation back to to meaningful policy discussion mm-hmm. and away from a lot of the social issues that take up a lot of airtime uh, in our politics currently, but don't actually have that much of an impact on on folks' day to day lives. And we think that women are u- uniquely positioned to want to have those conversations and to be willing to work together, even if they disagree on nine things, find the one thing that they do agree on and work from there. And we think a lot of times women's groups are really labeled and, and stuck on the social issues and don't get to the meat of the problem, which often is is more substantive policy, free market capitalism, for example, you know, deregulation. Those are things that we want to spend Responsible our time Responsible immigration reform. Yeah, right. Absolutely. Yeah, I mean, not open borders, which I don't know if that's uh, where the Democrats are leading us. But that's not that's a alienating idea. Also, to go to your point about young women, I mean, I I sometimes wonder if this round just hasn't lost the next generation of young women. I mean, I have a 27 year old daughter and a almost 17 year old daughter. Both of them are very politically engaged and they're they're following all of this and. They would agree on so many of the trade and policies and be open to everything that you were saying. But I just I I just can't see them becoming Republicans. It's it's become such a tainted brand. Well, I think until the Republican Party makes space for, you know, not having limits tests. Right. I, I, I don't see how that's possible. Right. I mean, we frankly get all sorts of vitriol online, calling us Democrats, Democrats, many other not so nice words. But almost all of it revolves around the idea that we're not Republicans. And right. you can go and check my credentials. Like, right. I, I mean, I'm not a Democrat. Uh, that, that's one of the things I have to say. It really annoys me. Just as feminists say you can't be a feminist, it really annoys me when there are self-declared people in a in a party or a political movement who says, you know, 
because you're not exactly like them and believe everything that they believe, you are therefore not a conservative, Republican, whatever. I think we I think Ronald Reagan is a great example. And certainly the Republican Party loves to harken back to the Reagan era. Reagan era was big tent. Mm-hmm. It was big tent. It said we may not agree on everything, but the gist of what we agree on and what we believe is how we're going to lead. Mm-hmm. And we're not going to worry about our differences kind of on the fringes. But now that the fringes are really dictating kind of the directionality of both parties, we've lost a lot of that, I think, on both sides. And mm-hmm. it's dangerous for all of us. And I think uh, Bill Clinton, despite all his faults, was big tent. Yeah. And he was, he was as you know, as that Southern Democrat, he was somewhat, you know, nuanced on on social issues. He understood, he had respect mm-hmm. for uh, conservatives and, under, you know, worked with them. And also recruiting women. The Republican Party under the Bushes always sought out female candidates and, mm-hmm. and or not just candidates but but really? in the administration Cause it, cause it, they didn't do a very good job no but <laughs> but it wasn't there was that sense that at least you ought to but when you're telling me these stories of you know how they're treating up and coming candidates let alone you see who they're appointing mm-hmm. and they're um, so clueless when it comes to ta- I, I once had uh, that uh, I don't know what's worse uh, you know a republic a male Republican ignoring women's issues or addressing them. Oh. You know, equally terrifying. <laughs> Which is equally more terrifying. terrifying. That is a phenomenal line. If you don't mind, I'm <laughs> absolutely going to use that in other, in other speaking engagements because I think you've just hit the nail on the head. It is really scary when it's a room full of, of and I love them, white middle-aged men making decisions that impact women without women's involvement at all. And, and just the way they talk about them. And they think, oh, okay, it's something kind of alien. And, right. And, you yeah. know, if you had more women there, and, and conservative women, you mm-hmm. know, would, would show them how you talk about things. Now, I think they all would talk about them more intelligently if there were intellectuals and writers and lawyers, you know, researching the issues and, and have a kind of conservative cultural studies center, if you will, or gender yeah. studies. We need that. Well, and I think, Danielle, to your point, I keep coming back in my head right after the Kavanaugh confirmation. You know, there were all sorts of talks about whether or not that was a bump for Democrats or Republicans. But I read this quote from a Republican strategist that said in terms of the fundraising, he said, yeah, of course, suburban Republican women are now fundraising for Democrats. But you know what? They were never with us to begin with. So who cares? Mm -hmm. And I feel like that's the pervasive attitude. And really, to me, this is when you're dealing with anger we all have a stake in this country, right? And if you feel like you can't use your voice or it's not heard, you're going to get frustrated. And our mother used to say, and, and Cody was reminding me of this on our way in here, that anger is a secondary emotion. I think most women are angry because they feel frustrated. They feel scared. That's where the anger is coming from. It's not just blanket anger. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Well, okay. So where can our listeners find you? What What's the... So yeah, the best way to support or if you, if you believe in these 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 issues or the need for more centrality, what 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 should we what should we be doing aside from going out to vote? Obviously. Oh, yeah. Vote. <laughs> That's vote. critical. Um, That's vote. That critical. first. Do that first and foremost. You can find us at GOP Women for Progress dot org. Uh, we also have a medium page uh, and we highlight our different candidates that we're supporting and working with. And then we also are, are going to be rolling out our policy platform after the election. If I could say in closing, we want to be a lighthouse in the fog because I think there are a lot of women, a lot of people who are very disillusioned right now and, and are feeling kind of like they don't fit in either camp and there's no space for them. And, and we want to say that from at least from our side, there is space for those conversations and and we welcome you. And we have a lot of conservative Democrats who are involved. I was going to say, like, do you have room do. for oh, yeah. tent for... We have Democrats. men. We have male <laughs> conservative <laughs> Democrats and Republican women for progress. So I think we uh, we will make space. We are big tent mentality. And we would, you know, of course, encourage uh, the same thing on, on the Democratic side. And we've partnered with Emily's List on a, on a few things. So I think there's a real desire to be welcoming and inclusive to like-minded people, regardless of the label behind your name. Mm-hmm. Right. Well, thank well, you. What? Oh, excellent sorry. femsplaining. Yes, excellent Thank femsplaining. You. And and I think, you know, they could, when we start the Femsplaining Institute. Yes. Definitely. Oh, yeah. Yes. <laughs> we'll, give me a call. <laughs> your, 
<laughs> give you a call. <laughs> All right. Thank you. Thank you, Ariel. Thank you for having us. Yeah, thank you so much. Oh, we forgot the most important part of the podcast. Yeah, no, I always yeah, forget I this. Oh, okay. and we, <laughs> that's my, that's my right, right. Zoe reminded us. I, I, we get so into the conversation, we forget to We ask. forget the most important yeah. thing. That what unites is your people everywhere. cocktails? I'll let you start if you want. Do we have a red and a blue cocktail? I'm a... Uh, Oh, this is good. I'm I'm boring. I love uh, Tito's and club soda with a lemon. <laughs> nice, uh, nice and neutral. You're right. Yeah. And locale, <laughs> locale. Low yeah. Okay. I would say that mine takes a little bit more effort. I have a vodka infuser, so I do my own stoli dolies. So pineapple infused vodka. You let it sit for about two weeks. You can drink it either on the rocks or with a little bit of club soda, and it is Ooh. delightful in the summer. I've I've infused. You know, I, you always think it's going to be very time consuming. And in fact, it's not. You just pop oh, yeah. some you stuff just pop in, it in there, get it in the <laughs> cupboard and come back yeah. two weeks. Yeah. yeah. OK. All right. Maybe we should we should work on our infusions. Ooh, yes. <laughs> I want maybe I can improve the Cure Royale with some infused. I don't know. I bet we could. Uh, lavender or something. I mean, <laughs> infused anything always makes things better. OK. OK. All right. Thank, <laughs> thank you. you so thank much, you, ladies. I hope you're enjoying the Femsplainers. Why not hang out with us more? Yes, come socialize with us on social. Find us on Twitter and Facebook at Femsplainers. And follow our antics inside the studio and out on Instagram and Femsplainer Podcast. And find us at your favorite podcast hangout. Since joining the E1 Network, we are everywhere. And not just on iTunes and Google Play, but Spotify and other places. And you can always download new episodes directly at the E1 Podcast homepage or even our own website, femsplainers.com. And please don't forget to like us before you go or share us with your friends. We'd love to hear from you. Reach out to us directly via contact at femsplainers.com. And cheers. Here's to our listeners. Be a Femsplainer. Well, I wish them the best of luck, Christina. That's a tough task that they've got ahead of them. It is, and I do wish them luck. And I wish all of us. Uh, all of us have centrists have centrists. something. We something. Need a home. We need a home. We're homeless, and we need... Well, what did you think, Zoe? We've got our generation Zoe here, all of 23 22. 22. Even oh younger. Gosh. Zoe, weigh in. Give us the young. Yeah. What do you think of what they were saying about younger women and identifying Republican? And what well, did you I think? I think, so I, I self identify as a libertarian, which I, I, I consider centrist for the most part. I mean, I just think, you know what I think of libertarians? I think what they really believe is they just want to have sex with whoever they want sex <laughs> with and not pay taxes. And they and want to be able to sell nuclear weapons and right. weed. home. Weed. And weed. And, yeah. that's, and that's it. Yeah, you know, that's not, that's not far <laughs> off. No, I, um, I really think that they offer a lot of ideas that I wish were talked about amongst my generation a lot more, because um, I definitely feel out of place, and I don't even really consider myself a Republican or a Democrat, really. What issues do you miss, like what that they brought up? <sighs> I think the fact, I like the fact that so many people my age use abortion as like, the, ter- the determining factor of whether or not you are a Democrat or a Republican or if you're a good or a bad person. Mm-hmm. And I think that it's a lot more complicated than that. Mm-hmm. And the fact that they are trying to find a platform that's not focused entirely just on being pro-choice or pro-life isn't really something that I see from women, number one, but from people on either sides of the aisle. And it's a really nice sort of refreshing thing, especially as a millennial. To yeah, I've looked at the data on abortion. You're not a millennial. And just remember that. Oh, right. I gen. I gen. I gen. Men and women overall are about the same with right. respect to abortion. I mean, you can't, it's not, there's not a huge gender gap when it comes to abortion. Well, there's also, it's one of the, abortion is one of those things, it's like, as we discovered um, last week with guns, that when you actually look at the consensus, the majority of Americans are like for legal abortion, you know, up to a point there. Everybody has their stopping point. But there is a quite a, a, you know, a big majority for that view, just as uh, we found with guns, that gun owners and non-gun owners come together on certain aspects of gun gun control. So we'd think that that would be the case. You'd think. 
for it. <laughs> <laughs> but we'd be wrong. I've gone to two colleges for undergraduate, and both of them have had a, a left lean, though different degrees of left lean. And I think there's just there's just no dialogue. And that doesn't happening. drive you into the Republican Party? Um, no, it hasn't happened for me yet. Both Both sides really don't feel like home for me at this point. So Do you look at it like my daughters do? And I honestly, I, I don't blame them. They just look at it as this party of old white men, which yeah. has was not true for a while. But, you know, especially in, that, as like you, in the oh. Nixon administration, it was diverse. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, in more, I mean, in more and recent, and, and, well, more recent times. And then suddenly under Trump, I mean, that, as you pointed out in the Kavanaugh trial, you're like, what? Yeah. These guys are all. And how couldn't they have had an effective sort of something similar similar to Emily's list. You know, why aren't there groups? I'm, I'm sure there are, but mm-hmm. nothing on, the, on that right. scale of recruiting. And they're out there. I mean, I speak to, that's largely who invites me to campus, or libertarian and conservatives. And right. it's often uh, the women are the president of the club, and there's a lot of talent coming along. And yeah. uh, the, the conservative kids are very impressive because they know the arguments of the other side. They've had to contend with them. Mm-hmm. They tend to be great debaters. They they don't oversimplify. They don't caricature the other side because they've lived with it. Mm-hmm. It's quite the opposite. And yeah. then the left-wing students come and they've they've never encountered anybody who was whatever pro free market or something. They're, <laughs> right. They're astonished and think all they have to do is call you names. And I think that's that's why I could never find a home in the Democratic Party because I feel like the general consensus, especially with people my age, is that I'm supposed to be angry about everything all the time that's happening, no matter what the issue is. Which is so tiring. Boring. <laughs> and and it, yeah, it's boring. Angry. It's who wants to be around angry people? <laughs> and also, don't the kids your age recognize, the, the young women especially, that they are the most the opportunity rich young women in exactly. world history and they can do whatever they want within reason and uh, but compared to probably anywhere else in the world they have more opportunities advantages and particularly from the elite schools right. and yet at this moment you're supposed to be bitter and angry about and everything believe the men at your college are waging right, but a war everybody's against everybody's negative that's the thing it's like the men are now like this whole cycle is turning everybody against everybody and so why don't we start the happiness yes, party that's, that's going to be part of the Femsplainer Institute <laughs> initiatives yes. and there will be cocktails <laughs> we're going back now a couple of weeks but you had some update on what we were talking about. Yes, we with, talked about a professor who Helen was Pluck- your professor yes. at Sarah Lawrence College, Samuel J. Abrams, and my colleague at AEI. Mm-hmm. And he did a very interesting study. People talk about how far left professors are, but in fact, the most left-leaning group on the modern campus are the administrators, and especially the college life. And is almost the, before our students arrive on campus, these are the groups that determine summer reading and, you know, send them into all sorts of workshops and preside over dorm, dormitory life. And he, he just noticed that at Sarah Lawrence, all the activities were things like stay healthy, stay woke, <laughs> understanding white privilege. Micro so off. I want to go to the barbecue. <laughs> like, where's the barbecue? <laughs> so he just did a little study and got a, a good press in New York Times and elsewhere. But at Sarah Lawrence College, there's been backlash. Yes, to say the least. The, <laughs> yeah. So incarnation of evil, the avatar of all that's bad and yeah. so toxic. What's funny enough is that this is not the first time that Sam has publicly said, I'm a conservative teaching on a liberal campus. He's he's written for The New York Times before. He's done studies about the left lean with professors. You know, this this wasn't really new information to the campus as a whole. All right, but how did they respond? Not well, I take it. They did not respond well. Within 24 hours of the article being released, his office door was vandalized hmm. um, with several signs calling for him to quit, telling him to go back to Charlottesville, where he belongs. Oh, implying he's a Nazi. Yes, yes. A Jewish Nazi. Yeah, another another one of those (laughs) Jewish Nazis. They're everywhere. (laughs) And they had a town hall meeting and called for the president to fire him. Wait wait a minute. A, A town hall meeting that was sponsored by the school? Yes, that was held by their student government. 
Oh, of course, because yeah. they're under attack, I guess, because yeah. any criticism or the and, suggestion that they might be a little more inclusive. Right. And it was what's so what's so funny to me is I've had, you know, so many friends and former students of Sam's reach out to me, you know, because I, I work as his research assistant now, but I was a student for of his Wait for minute, two years. Wait a minute, you're his research assistant now? I am. Yeah. And I was when I was at Sarah Lawrence as well, too, which is funny. I thought you were my research assistant. I'm yours, too. But I have She's to too timey. Oh, yeah. God. Okay. <laughs> but no, I had, I had so many individuals who are very, very far to the left reach out to me and say, I can't believe what people are saying about Sam. I can't believe how they are they're spinning this and how they're making this into an issue that it's that it's just not that they're so angry about it. And one of my good friends said, I just wish I had time to be angry. He was like, I wish I had the time that these people have on campus to be angry about the smallest little thing, because, you know, people across the the spectrum, the political spectrum have said, if you have Sam Abrams as a professor or if you hear him speak or if you, you know, go to one of his classes, you'll see he challenges people on both sides of the aisle. And that's exactly what this piece did. And it's being spun in this way that just I, I can't wrap my head around the logic of it at this point. Do you think he's in, he's, he's not in serious trouble of a Title IX investigation or something like they did? I mean, I hope, <laughs> I hope not. I hope not. I hope not. Well, well, you just have to remember on campuses, there's always one side to every opinion. Right. <laughs> so, the full gamut from A to B. Okay, well, let's get to some of this listener feedback. Some of these are, Christina, you've been in Portland so often that we're just having to go back into time. But tell me if you're, since we're doing a political oriented show, a person named Adrian asked if you had plans to address the gender gap in any way on the show. I'm definitely not talking about the left versus right debates, which appear to be causing all sorts of mayhem. And he brings a a Vox article graph just showing that women's earnings don't uh, drop significantly after having a child and men's don't. I mean, you write about this and talk about this all the time, but have things changed in a gender gap for idiots like me? Just in a nutshell, what is the problem and is it still the problem? It, it, well, here's the thing. It's still a problem because of this phenomenon of the feminization of poverty. A disproportionate number of poor people in this country are women with children who mm-hmm. can't make a, you know, a very good living. So that is a problem. Unfortunately, I think that the academic feminists and the women, you know, the activists have misdescribed it and largely stress uh, that it's the fault of employers. Unscrupulous Mm -hmm. employers are cheating women out of almost 25% of their salaries. That's just wrong. Uh, The the reason there's a gap is complicated, but largely it depends on what you study in school and how many years you have been in the workplace and, and are you available for unusual hours. Now, feminists can correctly push back and say, well, okay, it's not caused by employers, but maybe our society is sexist in that it makes it impossible for women to have children and be in the workplace and make a good living. And uh, so we should change gender roles and so forth. And, you know, we've been, people have been trying to do that. And it's not always effective. Well, how does it, how do we compare to other societies where there is more even state-sponsored child care? Well, that's very interesting because it's called, the, I guess, the Nordic paradox. If you look at the Scandinavian countries, they have been focused very aggressively on eliminating the the gender gap and having Mm. an egalitarian society. And they have not succeeded. They've done everything that women's activists here want and, you know, magnificent benefits. And they have health care, I assume, too. The whole thing. And uh, two things happen. The private sector that pays more doesn't want to hire them, so the women tend to work for the public sector. And the second thing is um, that once women are given a lot of time off and, you know, get a year off of paid leave and so forth, the ability to work part-time for a year when they get back, and so they lose their connection to the workplace and begin to become more focused on the home. So the more opportunities you give women to be at home, the more a lot of them will take it and make Mm -hmm. it permanent. So we see American women just soaring ahead in terms of managerial positions and uh, high, you know, there's no comparison how far ahead we are uh, to Sweden. And that's really interesting. Right. Well, I I think I would, you know, the movement I want to start 
is reintegrating mothers back into the workforce when their kids go to school. Because mothers, have I ever told you my theory of the mother's brain, what happens after you give birth? Yes, I think I remember. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's a commuter analogy, but what you lose in memory space, you gain in processing. Mm -hmm. That your brain, yeah, you start to forget everything. But you become this master multitasker processor, this supreme manager of everything. And also, you know, balancing complex, per demanding personalities and things. And I'm, you know, I almost wonder that for women who do take some time out of the workforce, I, I think they are more valuable employees when they come back in. I mean, even if there's some training needed, I think hiring, and then especially as people live longer, women into their 50s and 60s. Well, uh, a lot of companies ha have very good policies because they can't afford to lose the women. Right. So I've had friends who worked for banks and law firms and wanted to take time off. And they, they, they're, when you're valuable to a company, they right. know it and they'll try to hang on to you. Right. The, the thing is, there's no easy answer, mm -hmm. and it's going to be complicated, and there are going to be costs and benefits. So if we right. adopt the Swedish model, which I, can you imagine this, you know, any American Congress passing full-time no. government-funded daycare and family leave and, and all of that, I can't imagine it. And they've tried. It's not passed. Democrats right. and Republicans didn't uh, manage to pass it. So, uh, you know, there's that hurdle. But even if we overcome that and have it, it's not... There may be just be a difference between men and women, and we're never going to achieve that kind of parity. Or, or we may. I mean, maybe this is up to Generation Z. Like, we don't think about how much the workplace is changing. And these, you know, Good different point. workplaces, especially that you see in Silicon Valley where everybody seems they're age 12 and, you know, they've got all these programs and cultures that promote everybody as you can do more work from home, so long as the economy is doing well. And women do bring incredibly valuable skills, especially these days with the levels of education, that I think these companies are going to work very, very hard to keep their female employees. They're going to find ways, if, if it's not, you know, why does it have to be government subsidized daycare? Why can't these corporations, corporations. build in things to help their and women as, employees? As, you know, and, and women have soared ahead of men in education, right. getting more degrees, advanced degrees than men. So they're going to be critical to the workforce. But I think we should help the boys in education, too. So there are women who, maybe as many as 60%, when they have kids, they would like to be able to take time off. Right. And so I like your idea of retraining. and Because you do, you, you, it's a very dangerous thing for men or women. Right. They've, they've looked to at leave. Who yeah, when you leave. It, when you it's, leave. You're lost, and you lose your cohort. You you just lose that. On the other hand, when you come back, which I did at a weird later stage in life. I, I never went, remember you dropping out. You were always... No, I always worked as a writer, but I went back in a managerial position uh -huh. for the Huffington Post. Oh, yeah. And I was 49, 50 when I did this, and that was a first exposure to being surrounded by 22, 24-year-olds. And for all of their mocking of me, like... You know, how you are with your parents trying to show them how to get back on Facebook or how to, <laughs> you know, I say, oh, I don't understand what this term means. Or can you help me with this getting into this program or Slack? God help us. Slack is the worst program ever invented. On the other hand, the wisdom I could bring to them that they would, you know, little lines into my office about I could teach them things, not just perspective, but life, that, that it was actually a very beneficial relationship, I found that one went both ways, once you could sort of overcome the technological challenges or whatever training challenges you needed coming back into the workforce. Yeah, I think that, I just think it has to happen. Right. And I think the millennials, to say something nice about iGen, I think they're probably open to that mm -hmm. and uh, have a sense of the, just the injustice and the loss of excluding so many people from the workplace because they've stayed home to raise children. Right. Okay. So that well, so we got a bigger answer for that listener. And I think we only have time maybe for one more and then we'll do some more next time. Okay. This is romantic advice, which we are getting. And it's from someone who wants to be called mansplain E. And it said, I need some advice. I'm almost twenty nine years old. I went to college at twenty four. I always thought that I was incapable of love, 
and I've never been in a relationship longer than a few weeks. Then one summer in college, I began interning at no other place than the greatest American Enterprise Institute, oh. which is where we record the Femsplainers every week. So he was here, this man, this man Splainy. And after a few weeks, as more interns were coming, I turned to see the new one sitting next to me, and I skipped a heartbeat. But I what don't know. Zoe, was it? Oh, I, we don't know. No, she said you weren't an intern. I don't know what it was about her. Research assistant. But I just couldn't stop thinking about her from that one second. There was one obstacle. She had a boyfriend. A few months later, they broke up. I'm reading this like a ghost story. I confessed my crush, to put it mildly, to her. And she couldn't have been sweeter about it. Since she's from D.C., we met up a few months later when I was in town and went on a date. A year later, we went on another date when I was back here interning. The dates went pretty great. Now I'm in D.C. permanently. We went on another date, which I believe went pretty well. The problem is that due to her job, she is almost never in town for a whole day and has to travel. And when she is, she naturally prefers to spend time with her friends and family. Blah, and doesn't have time to start something from scratch. Blah, blah, blah. In the meantime, what can I do to stay in the margins of the picture for life? And reminder that I'm still here. Ooh. It what? doesn't sound very promising. Okay, okay, let's get let's get uh, Zoe's advice. She's the tr- she could she could have been this woman. Yeah, it could be her. What would you say to Mansplainy? So speaking from personal experience as somebody that has a full time job and is constantly a very, very busy individual at my age. If you are really interested in someone, you will make time for them. Right. And I think I've used that as an excuse before in the past for not wanting to pursue a certain person, saying that I am too busy and that I would rather make time for other things. But I think the reality of the situation is, in my relationship, where both of us work all the time and still go to school, we make time for each other. So it's kind of like being work zoned. Yeah, yeah your work zone. That's a good term. She's just not that into you, man. I know. I was thinking. But at least he found he could love. So there are a lot of other cute girls around. Yeah, a lot so of other I fish in the sea. You waited like, one year for yeah, another. Yeah, you're like twenty nine. That's when most men most men become serious a little later, a little later than women do. Yeah, yeah. So I would I would hang in there, but mm. clearly not her. But not her. There's he's not the one. DC is full of young people. Yeah, we're we're just go out and to to bars. Is that where you go? <laughs> that sounds oh. awful. Don't do. That. I don't know. <laughs> we learn we learn Parties. from Beck Dory Stein. Weddings. Don't go to the bars. When your friends start getting <gasps> w- to weddings. You meet a lot of nice girls. Mm. There you go. All right. Well, that's. I think that's it for this week. Everybody vote. All femsplainers vote. Whoever you're voting for, just go vote. Especially Republicans out there. No, I'm kidding. What? I'm kidding. I'm kidding. <laughs> Thank you.